I have my PowerPoint and everything. Looking good. I just remembered about an hour and a half ago that I was speaking here today. So well done. thank you to Rachel for letting me know. Um, so I'm Dana Scheider. Uh, I'm going to be talking about contract and collaboration testing in Ruby. Um, I've given this talk to a couple of different audiences, um, and everybody has had a massively different background. So I wanted to start out with a couple of questions for you, the audience. Um, first of all, who here, who here understands what I mean when I say contract and collaboration testing? That's probably a bad question, but um, all right. Um, most of the people I've talked to have not had any idea what that is or what data contracts are, so I'm going to try to um, clarify those things as I go to make sure that everybody is following, please feel free to yell questions or ask for clarification while I'm going. Um, I'm always happy to answer them and respond to hecklers as long as they're nice. So a um, little bit about me. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I'm a Ruby developer and a quality engineer. I'm the author of Rambo, which is a collaboration and contract testing tool for Ruby. I'm on the Cucumber core team. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I encourage you to do that. You'll be exposed to a lot of tweets about my daily frustrations as a developer um, and as a human being. So um, I wanted to start with a couple definitions. So when I talk about an API, the word API has kind of a, kind of a lot of meanings. In general, I say that the term API refers to the means through which software applications talk to one another or through which parts of a single application talk to each other within that application. Um, often when we say API, we're referring specifically to a web API, such as a REST API or, um, uh, or a service that's contacted over HTTP to request data. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be using both of these terms somewhat interchangeably. Generally, if I say API, I will be referring to a web API, but I'm going to try to be clear about that. A client is any application that contacts and consumes data from a web API. So the most common example would be a browser. Uh, you can also have things like a calendar app that contacts Google calendars or any of a wide variety of things. Um, I'm also going to be talking about RAML, which is the REST API modeling language. That's a YAML-based language that's used to describe how web APIs are intended to interact with their clients and what the clients can expect from the API. Um, an endpoint. When I say endpoint, I'm referring to a unique URI that represents a resource or collection of resources. So in English, that means a URL. Maybe your app has users. So you'll have an endpoint that is slash users that somebody can go to to request a list of all the users that you have in your database, that kind of thing. Um, any, any unique URL can generally be regarded as an endpoint. Microservices architecture. This talk especially applies to working with microservices, which are characterized by a lot of small services communicating with one another through web APIs. So it's essentially the concept of modularity applied to entire apps, where each function of your entire app is extracted into a separate app that communicates with the others as needed. Um, finally, a data contract is a document that details the way a service is guaranteed to behave toward its client or clients. So a microservices architecture is the logical extension of the single responsibility principle. What is the single responsibility principle? This is the idea that every class or module you write needs to do one thing. If you have a class or a module or other unit of code doing multiple tasks, 
those should be separated into modular components that do only one thing and then talk to each other through an API. The concepts I'm going to be talking about are not limited to microservices, but are especially applicable to them. Um, microservices lend themselves to fast, reliable, and low maintenance test suites. This is a really nice thing. Uh, a lot of us who have tested web services before or websites have experienced the test flakiness or just slow tests or tests where it's hard to track down where failures are coming from. And microservices make it really relatively easy to avoid those kinds of problems. So how do they do that? They can do that through a number of testing techniques that I'll cover briefly, um, culminating in contract testing that clarifies what the characteristics of a given service will be and how it will behave toward its clients. So what are the characteristics that I'm talking about? A web API will have, first of all, accepted protocols. So most often this will be HTTP or HTTPS. That's what I'm going to be assuming for the time being. It will have some available endpoints accepting certain HTTP methods. So maybe you have a user's endpoint that accepts a post request to create a new user or a get request to retrieve the list of users. It'll also have an authorization or authentication scheme. What you have to do to verify that you're authorized to certain data. URI parameters. If you have an endpoint like slash users slash one, that one is a parameter. It tells you which user you're going to be using. Um, another characteristic is the format and requirements of requests. Do you require particular headers? What data formats are accepted? That could be JSON or XML or some other format entirely. And within that data structure, what keys and values are there? Do you require that there be a username? Do you require that the user include a street address? Um, is there a limit on the formats of certain items? Must the date of birth be a date? Um, are there any keys that are not accepted? And you have much the same thing for response characteristics. What formats the response can be in, what keys and possible values there are for the responses. Um, are we not turned on? Oh, there we go. Um, what? <laughs> Sorry. All right. We're really not haunted, I promise. <laughs> OK, turn it right now. All right. Is this working? Uh, it sounds like it's working, yeah. Um, so again, headers that the client can expect to receive and status codes. If it's successful, maybe it will get, it will give back a 200, maybe if it can't find the endpoint, a 404. So what those status codes are and what leads to which status being returned is an important characteristic of a response. So a data contract then is a contract between two services, a, a service and its client, that describes what those characteristics are expected to be and guarantees to the client that a particular kind of request will work to retrieve a particular kind of response. There are two kinds of contracts. There are provider and consumer driven contracts. A consumer driven contract is a contract where, uh, where the developers of one service say to the developers of another service, this is the information we need and this is the format that we need it in. And they write a contract driven by those needs. That's really useful for APIs where there's a small number of clients talking to a small number of providers. On the other hand, if you're Facebook, you might need to have a provider-driven contract where you're saying what kinds of requests you accept and what kind of data you'll return and dictating that to all the clients that use your service. That's a provider-driven contract. Data contracts provide a guarantee that a particular version of the API will have certain characteristics. They don't provide 
they don't provide a prescribed course of action if the contract is breached. That's an external policy issue. Um, the contract itself simply provides for what, what characteristics the API is guaranteed to have. Data contracts facilitate interoperability between services. They make it really clear what one service can expect from another um, in the absence of tribal knowledge or other informal channels for checking what one service provides another. They specify how the APIs meet business needs. What does the organization need one service to provide to another? And they can be aggregated into a single contract for a given service, representing the entirety of that service's behavior. So if I'm an API and I have a contract with this service, this service, and this service, I can just combine those terms into a single contract that's my contract. Um, we already talked about client and provider-driven contracts with client driven contracts being used for services with few clients and provider driven contracts being used by services with many clients. Yes? Um, at the end of um, the, the next to last slide, um, you mentioned aggregation. Uh, that seems like kind of an important point, but I, I didn't understand. Oh, yeah. So if I have a service that has a couple of endpoints, um, I'll give an example at the end that's a little service that I wrote that calculates things based on data that a person passes in. Um, in this case, personal data. If you pass it a date of birth, it will give you an age. If you pass it a weight in pounds, it'll give you a weight in kilograms, that kind of thing. So it may have a client that needs the age and a client that needs the weight and a contract with each of those that, um, that specifies what that endpoint will provide and then you just put those into one document and that's the aggregated contract for the whole service. Yes? What do you consider the service Zapier um, in, the, in the whole definition? The services? Zapier, like the API, the web page? No? Um, oh, um, that's a client. Um, in this model, that any kind of a front end that you have is going to be an API client. Um, so, End-to-end -end testing is one thing that we're mostly familiar with. I mean, I think a lot of us who have tested APIs have done some form of this before. Um, gone through a front end and hit all of the back end functionality going through. Um, maybe, we, maybe you've used something like Selenium for this or Capybara. Uh, there are a number of options, but the defining feature is that you're going in through whatever the user facing front end is, touching whatever functionality you need, and then, and then figuring out what fails in between. This is really great for making sure that the system is meeting the needs of the organization, but it has problems. It can be very slow. It can be costly in developer time and money. It lengthens the feedback cycle for developers who have to wait for an entire suite to run often for QA to run that suite, and then they have to sit on their hands while they wait to find out what that tells them. The test can be unreliable, because if any part of the system fails, then that causes the test to fail. It can also be difficult to determine the source of failures. For instance, if I'm writing a web front end, any of the back end services failing might result in my getting a 500 response from whatever service I contact. That can be extremely frustrating trying to track down exactly where that failure originates. Integration testing is a, little, is a level further down. With integration tests, you're testing an entire service or a cluster of services that are closely related. This is um, more reliable than end-to-end -end testing and ensures that those pieces of the system work together. The important similarity between integration testing and end-to-end -end testing is that both are implementation agnostic. In neither of those cases are you going to, are the tests going to know what classes there are or what methods they have. All of that goes on under the hood. 
and it should be tested with unit tests. Unit testing involves testing internal components, um, testing that a particular method does what it's supposed to do, that a particular class behaves in a certain way. In many cases, unit tests will isolate units by using doubles or mocks or stubs to make sure that anything that goes wrong in the test actually is going wrong in that unit and not in some other peripheral unit. Unit testing is great because it's fast and it's cheap and it's reliable. On the other hand, it's operating at a level that abstracts the needs of the organization into code. And so you lose something in the ability to describe the needs of the organization in the tests. Um, to a large extent, the distinction between end-to-end -end integration and unit tests is a distinction of degree and not kind. Integration tests could be said to be an end-to-end -end test for a single app. Um, even a unit test, in some cases, might not, op might not isolate the single unit entirely from its dependencies. Um, So-called social unit testing will allow a unit to coexist with other parts in its vicinity, and failure in any one of those might cause it to fail. Um, so the, the kind of testing that I really want to talk about today is contract testing. Contract testing is very important for web APIs because it directly tests that a data contract is being fulfilled. Contract tests test whatever API is made available to the consumers of a given service um, described by the data contract. Usually, these will work by making actual or faked network requests to the service using rack test or webmock or some tool of that nature. Contract testing is important because it verifies that at the individual service level, the app is meeting business needs. It also keeps the tests relevant to the needs of the API consumers. So if you have, um, if you have internals in, a, um, in an API, those can be tested in the unit tests, while the contract test makes sure that the correct data is being returned to the client. Uh, this ensures that the service works as documented. Yes? So like I know you just said that these types of tests you described are degrees. Mm -hmm. But would you put this, do you, do you call it an, an integration test then? Can you do this wise? Not necessarily. It, um, you could consider this a kind of acceptance test. And I don't mean to be pedantic with this, but I mean to say that the that opinions will differ about the degree to which it's appropriate to stub out different parts of the system. But I will give an example. Um, when, I was, when I was at my last job, we had an app that we used to, to run underwriting for loan applicants. So there was a complex set of decisions to be made about how much a client qualified to borrow based on a number of factors. And in each of those cases, what would be returned to the client would be a JSON object with the name of the rule and the result. So the result in most cases would be either eligible, unavailable, approved with stipulation, a few different options. And the contract tests tested that under each of those conditions, the correct value of that was returned to the client. So if it was supposed to be eligible, the client got eligible. What actually led to an eligible outcome was tested in the unit tests. So the contract test didn't go into things like, if the person has a bankruptcy on their record from eight years ago and they live in San Diego County, are they eligible? The contract test only covered, if they're eligible, does the client get an eligible result? Does that make sense? So are you saying correctness was more tested in unit tests, whereas contract testing is testing that the right types are Right, that, that for a given response, that the correct response is, tra is transmitted to the client. Um, so that ensures that the service works as documented. And 
you're testing two different things here because especially since business logic changes quite a bit, um, you're separating the you're separating the fine-grained details of business logic from what's being conveyed to the client and ensuring that the API works as expected regardless of the functioning of what's under the hood. That's abstracted away. Um, so Toby Clemson in an excellent article on the Martin Fowler website that I hope you'll all read writes, when writing automated tests of the modules which interact with external components, the goal is to verify that the module can communicate sufficiently rather than to acceptance test the external component. So in that same way, the goal here was to make sure that the client was notified of the correct lending decision rather than to test that that decision was arrived at in a correct way. Um, to a given service in a microservices context, the important thing to remember is that any other service in that ecosystem is external. It doesn't matter if you're writing that service or if it's an S3 bucket or, or what it is. If it's not the service being tested, it's external. Collaboration testing for the sake of completeness is used on the client application, verifying that the client makes correctly formed requests to the API in question. In that way, if you've made sure that the, that the provider API is meeting its contract and the consumer API is making the correct requests, then the system can be assumed to work as promised. So here's a, here's a little illustration of how contract testing and collaboration testing work together. In this case, you can see a simple diagram where the client makes a request to the web service and that outgoing request is examined in collaboration tests to see is it including the right headers, is it including the right data, um, is the authentication scheme correct, um, what, what is it including with the request, all of those questions. And then the contract tests look at the response from the from the provider service, um, asking substantially similar questions about the responses that it returns. So data contracts establish expectations between two services. Unit tests test the internal logic, and contract tests verify that that API behavior is in line with what the contract says. Then collaboration tests, which I'm not covering in as much depth, verify that that client is actually making the correct requests. Um, let's see, that was for open source bridge. Um, all right, so with, with web services, there are a number of challenges that you can run into when you're trying to test. One of them is multiple sources of truth. You can have documentation, data contracts, tests, and app code that all say different things about what the app does. Um, you can also have multiple points of failure where a system could be failing for any number of possible reasons. And then there can also be a lack of clarity about how a set of services is intended to work together to meet business goal. One solution for some of these problems is generated contract tests. Imagine if by generating a test using a data contract, you could create a set of tests that effectively tests that the API works according to how it's documented. This ensures up-to-date tests because it can be run on an automated basis in a continuous delivery system. And it also tests what matters to the consumers of the API and therefore to the organization. Rambo is a tool that does exactly that. Rambo generates tests in RSpec from data contracts written in RAML using JSON schema to give examples of requests and responses. Um, these tests can be generated and run in continuous integration. Um, I've personally used them in Travis. They can also be run in Jenkins or whatever other 
CI system you have in place, and it saves the request bodies and request schema, or the sorry, the request bodies and responses that are being used in the tests, so that in the event of failures, you can actually pull those out and look at what they are. So Rambo has three entry points. There's a command line tool, a rake task, and a pure Ruby API. It has options for Rails versus non-Rails apps. Um, those can be passed in to the command line. They can also be passed in in a rambo.yaml config file or in an option hash to the Ruby API. The other option that's available right now is for the for an API token. If you have a header that needs to provide a token when it makes a request, you can include the token in your rambo.yaml file or as a command line flag um, or as a Ruby option hash uh, item. So under the hood, Rambo has a document generator class that's creating paths and files from ERB templates. This is a lot like how Rails generates views. It, you have um, templates that generate the example groups and the helper file and populates those with whatever data are being used for the test. Rambo also generates data for the tests, which I'll go over briefly in a moment. Options that are captured at the entry points, such as Rails versus not Rails, API token, etc., can be passed through to the generator. And the JSON test data gem actually generates request bodies from the schemas given. So if you have some schema written in JSON schema describing what requests your API accepts, Rambo will actually take that as input and generate a request that meets the criteria. Um, requests are made using rack test. Um, the RAML RB gem is used to parse the RAML. That's a controversial choice, but the reason is that the existing RAML parsers in Ruby, the others don't handle RAML 1.0. So RAML RB it is. The RAML models module of Rambo then adds an, extraction, an abstraction layer for the RAML nodes. So you'll have, and I, I'll give an example of all this in a minute. So if you have an API, there's a RAML API class um, that, that holds in it the, the data pertaining to the API that can then get used to fill in the blanks in the, in the template. So generated request bodies and response schemas then go in the spec support examples directory and actual response bodies that the test receives are also saved in an output directory so that you can then compare those for troubleshooting purposes instead of having to deal with the ugly command line vomit that RSpec puts out. So, um, so to summarize, robust contract and collaboration tests reduce the need for end-to-end -end testing by providing clarity about exactly what the API is guaranteed to do and verifying that it does that. Using Rambo to generate the contract tests from contracts eliminates the problem stemming from multiple sources of truth and automatically tests that an API works as documented. So anybody who'd like to contribute to Rambo, I am the maintainer and I'm super friendly regardless of how I may come across. So, um, so I encourage you to take a look at it on GitHub. There are issues on there that are flagged for help wanted. So if anyone is interested, um, those are there and I try to make contributing easy. So I wanted to give a brief example of how this works. Um, here I am in my Rails app, which is Rambo Demo. And if we go here, this is, this is an example of a data contract. So it says it's called Personal Calculator. It has two endpoints, an age endpoint and a weight in kilograms endpoint. The age endpoint takes, uh, takes the profile of a person as input 
and returns the profile that was given to it along with the age based on the birth date. Weight in kilograms takes um, a profile of a person including their weight and what units the weight is given in, which has to be one of pounds, stones, or kilograms. And then it responds with whatever weight was given translated into kilograms. So taking this contract, we can run. Um, do I need to make this bigger, by the way? OK. Um, no, that was not what I wanted to do. There we go. Um, let me make sure that I think I might not have done this right. Oh, there it is. So it's Rambo Ruby is the gem. Um, So Rambo generated the tests, and let's look at what it generated. Here in the spec directory, you can see that this contract directory was generated. Um, it has, it generated this spec file, um, testing that each endpoint does what it says it does and returns the status expected. In the support directory, you can see that it generated this request body based on what the, on what the requirements were given in the schema. Um, you can see here that we have a little bit unusual first and last name. Rambo does this intentionally. Um, a lot of the time contracts are not sufficiently specific. So the JSON test data generator will generate data that meets the contract, even if it does not necessarily meet the spirit of the law. Um, as we know, computers don't have spirits, somewhat frustratingly. Um, well, mine sometimes has spirits, but, um, <laughs> but we need to make sure that the contract is written as specifically as it needs to be to make sure that the clients know what information to send. So why did it just do that? spirits. Um, and then this is a new this is a new thing that I just wrote today, this little app, and it doesn't actually work. But if I were to the API doesn't. But if I were to run the tests against it and it did work, then the responses it returned would go in this output directory so that I could take a look at what actually the API sent back. So that's um, so that's the story with Rambo. Um, here is, here's a link to the Toby Clemson article about testing microservices. I strongly recommend this. It, um, it clarifies many things and I think it's accessible to, uh, to many different skill levels. Um, RAML, for more information on the RAML specification, you can visit the RAML website. And then here is the information about Rambo and me. So does anyone have any questions that they haven't already asked? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I kind of glossed through that. Yes. That depends on the workflows in the given organization. In some cases, you won't have a choice but to write con or collaboration tests for your own app if you're writing a client. In a lot of cases, that will end up being the case. Um, uh, in organizations where the same organization owns all the clients and the services they contact, then it could be a number of things. You, I mean, you could have, for one thing, the same developers might be writing both the client and the service. Um, in that case, they would write both kinds of tests. You could also have different teams, in which case the developers that were working on one app would be writing the tests for that app. But it really depends on how the organization decides to go about it. Um, QA could also be doing all of these. Um, it's just a matter of how a given organization decides to organize its workflows. 
Um, with with databases, databases are a problem that Rambo has not fully solved. I'm working on this now and would love to have collaborators for it. Um, but right now, the it looks like the direction we're going is fixed your data. Um, that databases in the short run need to provide data that the test can use. Um, does that answer your question? I guess my question was less specific to Rambo, but just more at a high level. At a, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, generally, I'm trying to think what I would do if I were writing the tests manually, because there isn't another Ruby tool that generates them that I'm aware of. Um, the What I would do if I was writing contract tests manually is that I would use something like Factory Girl to generate to generate whatever data needs to be in the database and then wipe the database between test runs. I tend not to stub out databases since their interactions with the system also need to be tested. Is that more the answer you were looking for? Uh, yeah, I think so. So you're, you're saying, I guess I haven't used Factory Girl. Oh, OK. Yes. Yes. Mm hmm Right. And um, I like I call them, I'm not sure that anyone else would use this term, but I call them dynamically created fixtures, kind of. Instead of having a hard-coded fixture that you stick in there up front and rely on being there, you Factory Girl will create fixture data to stick in the database just for as long as it's needed and then clean it out when it's done. So. Any other questions? Yeah. So is the uh, JSON schema such that exists in the uh, RAML files that you're passing in, is that part of the RAML spec, or is that in that RAML app? Um, that's the JSON schema is allowed by the RAML spec. There's also, you can also define these things natively in RAML, but Rambo does not support that right now. Um, the Schemas, they can also be linked from an external file. Um, but I figured I would incorporate them here just for the sake of example. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Um, so in this case, yeah. So here we have the age endpoint. Is this visible back there? Um, so we have the age endpoint here, and it created it created this request body. So it's defining that this that the request body that's going to be used is the one in this example file. Um, here in the test, um, oops. We have uh, raked the sorry rack test method post that's posting the route with that request body. In this case, we don't have any required headers or anything that would need to be included. But if we did, Rambo would include those as well. Uh, here, this. In the middle, this writes it to the to one of the output files when it receives the response, so that that can be so that can be looked at in the event the test fails to see what's actually going on in there. And the response body is whatever the API comes out with when it receives this request, uh, and the test then compares that to this schema, which it pulled out of the RAML. No, no. Um, and in general, I would say it's ideal not to do that, um, just because you don't want to have your tests too coupled to the app code itself. Anybody else? Yes. No, it no the it tests the app code. It's not 
changing the app code. There's nothing, there's nothing that's going on in the, it's not creating data or manipulating the app code in any way, but it, um, but it touches whatever the app does to generate that response. So it's exercising the application with the kind of Yes. Right. Well, in this case, it's only it's only expecting that the response um, comply with the given schema. So it's in this case looking at it should have received a JSON object. It should have received a JSON object that has these properties and no more. The first name and last name have to be strings. The date of birth has to be a particular format. Those kinds of, those kinds of things are being tested. It's not, testing whether the, um, it's not testing whether the data are correct. It's only testing that they meet the criteria set forth in the schema. Yes. It, the matcher is using the JSON schema gem, yeah. Um, the, the JSON, the generated JSON is from the JSON test data gem. Yes? So since this is a microservice, mm -hmm. um, it, it only does one thing, kind of? This particular, yeah, this Rails app, this imaginary Rails app only does, um, only returns calculations based on the information that it gets that get passed into it. Is it stateful? Does it have storage? This one does not. Okay, so there's no there's nothing to set up, right? I mean, there's nothing to set up in this case, no. Does it does it make requests on external services to get in response to a request, does it make external requests and then come back? Or? It, it doesn't. That's what that's another thing that we're looking at for the for the next version. The way that Rambo was developed, Rambo was developed as an MVP generated uh, or using two particular services that we had written at the last company that I worked at. And so it was ultimately able to test, to provide comprehensive tests for those services. And they did not make external requests and were not um, at least not ones that needed to, that would have needed to be stubbed out, um, and they also did not persist data. So they're not; they might have been purely functional, but close. Right. Yeah. You, yeah. That would be a way of putting it. But, but um, then, if, if if something did make an external request, that would be probably where you would do the stubbing. Is that would have to be stubbed out? Yeah. And I would do that. Um, actually, oh no, one of the one of those services did did use stubs. And what we ended up having to do was we had to, we had to just configure that in the spec helper. We used webmock to, stub, to set up a stub before those tests were run. Automatically, Rambo generates tests that are, that are labeled type, requ yeah, type request. So request specs then would all have the stubs put in before them in the before filter. Yeah. Do you see any value in eventually having Rambo do collaboration testing as well? So if your microservice is also talking to other microservices and you have the Rambo files for those services, then you can test the outgoing requests when you make API requests. It's something. Yeah. the The question was whether that whether I would see value in having Rambo also do collaboration tests in the future, and the answer is that. Yes, that's something I'm thinking about. I'm not sure if I would do it with Rambo or with another tool, I, but it's definitely something that's being considered. I actually have a lot of things I'm considering for Rambo, but that's, that's the story for another talk. <laughs> um, did you have a question as well? Yeah, on your 
generated input, the date of birth is 2073. Mm -hmm. And in your output uh, schema, there's an age between 1 and 150. So obviously that could not work if the app did not have bugs, or you're somehow mocking the response. I would, yeah, I would fully expect that test to fail. And the reason would be because the data contract isn't specific enough. So, in, so if I were going to go through a test-driven cycle with this app, I would, I would say, okay, so the, the date of birth actually has to be limited. We can't have a date of birth in 2073. Anybody else? All right, thank you.